We live in an era of civilizational abstraction, of cities consuming nature. The collapse of the global south is also the collapse of Mother Earth. We live a spiritual crisis, a consciousness crisis. The global leadership collapses, and even as decay happens, new shots arise. New plans are growing. At the intersection of technology and regeneration, using the colonizer's language and platforms to decolonize the future. Hello to everyone tuning in. My name is Nolita Tinamvulo. I'm a 22-year-old coastal woman. Um, my clan names, for those to whom this information is relevant, are I'm a chemical engineering student from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. My previous work was primarily um, as a chairperson of a social enterprise incubator on our campus. Um, and I've also been working with various organizations, helping young people, at least younger than myself, um, learn, entre learn entrepreneurial skills and teaching them entrepreneurial thought using design thinking principles. And that is where my work intersects with decolonization and decolonizing the mind. When aiming to problem solve, I believe it's important to try to contextualize fully the extent and the basis of the problem, and also to fully understand the people who will be the beneficiaries of the solutions you're creating and the people that you're working with. In my context, that would be the young people that I was working with. Um, decolonization to me is an active part of innovation and entrepreneurial thought. So I'm hoping that through a discussion, like the discussion we'll be having today, um, we can further we can work to further understand how to link practical action with how we see our societies and how we wish our societies to be. Uh, but for now, I'll leave it on to Ord to introduce herself. Thanks, Nalida. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ord Chenet, and um, I am a French woman from um, from Brittany, France. So Brittany is a one of the six Celtic nations for people who are not familiar with the geography, but um, I'm also a white woman who works um, in uh, the field of indigenous food sovereignty and I've been working in the United States for the past 10 years. Um, I kind of define myself as a political ecologist also, although that's uh, um, very <laughs> controversial in many ways. I um, not per se an academic, um, although um, because I prefer to apply research and because that's kind of where I, I decided to head, but um, most of my work is focused on how to support indigenous innovation at the grassroots level. And um, now I'm moving more towards um, supports in the background with applied research and um, data. And so I'm working for this nonprofit called Village Earth. And uh, what we do is we provide um, uh, support to um, indigenous land rights in the United States um, by uncovering um, Amer the American um, apartheid in terms of agriculture and, and land rights and uh, the historical patterns of, of land oppressions. And um, we're un uncovering um, um, facts about that that have been kind of known for generations and especially by um, indigenous peoples and indigenous communities, but that have never been really put into um, numbers and figures. So that's what we do right now. And um, I will encourage you to um, check our, our new resource, the Native Food Sovereignty Index, which is uh, focused on um, um, providing alternative ways to assess, measure, and uh, monitor um, food systems and healthy food systems for U.S. native land. Um, the way that I connect with decolonizing work is because you cannot, um, you cannot do any work with uh, sustainability without addressing the, the um, unequal structure and an unequal injustice behind it. And that is a structural issue that has to do with the uh, racial division of labor. And uh, we will talk about this more in this talk, but um, that's kind of what uh, 
brings us together as opposed to today. But in the meantime, um, uh, Padma, if you can tell us about yourself. <laughs> Hi, Ode and Olita. Good to be with you t tonight or today, depending on where our listeners are, or people who are tuning in now. Some of us might be in the morning as Ode is now and Nolita is in the afternoon and I am late at night. So I'm in the Philippines. I was born and raised here and I currently live and work in the national capital region, although I grew up, was born and raised in Baguio, which is in the north of the Philippines in a mountain city. Um, and I am currently working with the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities, where I am project lead for the AGAM agenda. And AGAM is a Filipino word. We use it, we say it twice, AGAM AGAM, and it means foreboding. Um, but it also means, the root word AGAM also means the ability to think, and it also could refer to memory. And for us, this word kind of captures the uncertainties and ambiguities that we face um, under a climate crisis. And, um, and the reason I'm focusing on the word agam is that the way this work intersects with the work of decolonizing is that we are exploring ways that language matters the words that we use, the way we describe things, the stories we tell, but also the stories that are told about us um, by others. And um, just, just to illustrate a very simple illustration of, of how our minds are decolonized by literature, are colonized first by literature, is um, a few years ago, I also, I also run a bookshop, an independent bookshop with my sister and a team of strong young women in Baguio City. And we ran a um, young people's writing workshop. And it was uh, disturbing because in their short stories, the young Filipino writers wrote about characters with blonde hair and blue eyes who lived in countries that had snow and autumn and and we don't have that here and I and I I started to feel the importance of having stories in which we could recognize ourselves and stories which would encourage young people to tell to write about our realities rather than feeling like they had to write about something that's foreign to them in order for their writing to matter or for their stories to be good. So that's that's work I've been, that's a track of work I've been following for, for a long time. And now with the Agam Agenda, there's this opportunity to explore how this approach of um, finding our own way of speaking about climate without the jargon as a way to reimagine it and by reimagining it reimagining it can we also rework or reshape the way we're approaching it so that's um that's how i'm going to approach tonight's topic through art through literature and through language yeah uh, to add on to what you're saying about language literature, um, in the context of how I introduced um, my approach to this topic is that what I've seen with um, topics like this and a lot of lo um, wicked problems is that we have a large group of people working towards solving it. And that's fantastic because it can't be done by one person alone. Um, but in, I commonly see three categories of people who are looking at different types of problems, whether it be um, climate change or discussing climate change in the context of decolonization. The first would be people like yourself, Padma, who are working to, you know, craft the language that will um, and free us from our colonial thought, especially in prioritizing how to increase human dignity in the context of where we are and where we need to be. Um, and the second group of people are maybe people that are who 
are in the humanities and in a wide range of academic specializations who are now discussing on how to continue using the language that are that is being crafted to contextualize how these concepts fit in in different disciplines, um, whether it be science. Um, an article I read this morning by Wanga Zimbe Gabin, um, Gabile, I want to pronounce her name properly, um, on how decolonization could reshape um, South African science. Uh, I think for me, um, and perhaps for me in the context of being a, a person who is things, is what I'm yet to see is a lot more action from the third type of person who um, who wants to see how these two, the work of these two, in, like two groups of people that are proceeding can be translated to measurable impact. Um, and I'd love to hear from my fellow pan panelists, especially you, Ord, um, on where you see this translation to practical action is. Is it in policy making? What exactly is the missing key? Yeah. Thanks, Melita. That's a great and very complex question. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, I think that's really um, speaking about and, and kind of revealing that separation that we are seeing um, and that missing link that we are seeing um, between um, climate change and climate change struggles and, and ecology, um, ecological um, uh, discussions and narrative and decolonization and decolonial work. Um, the reason why that is, I think it's inherent to um, the way that the global political economy is actually built. And so um, um, basically we can see that divide, uh, which a lot of, a lot of authors are, are talking about and have been talking about for a very long time, but some, somehow as a, as a double fracture or a separation where uh, you basically have a movement of decolonial thinking and decolonial thought that's uh, led by people who have been colonized, who are coming from uh, colonized communities, and that is exclusively considered by the mainstream as an identity struggle, right? As a struggle that's about uh, regaining uh, rights, uh, that's about social justice, that's about racial justice, that's about establishing a, a, a just world for all, right? But um, in the social uh, realm and cultural realm, uh, rather than anything else. And so that is kind of an attempt uh, from the, the Western side, from the, the mainstream uh, scientific uh, establishment to kind of play down um, that, that, that struggle as being just a struggle about identity, right? And it's also, um, it's also hard, I think, for people in that space, especially for people from colonized community to uh, focus on other struggles because they're also facing very uh, um, uh, dire needs, right? In terms of, uh, we're talking about urgent matters. We're talking about matters of, of life and death uh, for a lot of folks. So um, that also kind of restrains that narrative, that 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 um, discussion of about decolonization um, around these identity struggles. And then on the other hand, we have climate change um, and um, the ecological narrative that's mainly dominated by whites um, in the um, in the field um, and also in the way that policy is is uh, made um, in the the, the higher decision making um, entities and and the way that 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 discourse is controlled is basically by um, keeping it about anything else um, 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 anything else but climate change in itself and how it might tie potentially to capitalism and to the way that we organize the system, but not make it anything about the way that we build the system as an unequal um, 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 racial division of labor to begin with. And so um, it basically uh, deletes, it, it makes it apolitical in a way, it deletes its historical structure, its uh, racial structure, and it's very problematic because it creates that division between these two narratives that are in fact uh, highly connected. And, and the way that they connect is seen every day. Um, we can see that in, in movements such as the environmental justice movements, which is not just talking about how people of color and colonized communities are um, disproportionately affected by climate change. It's in fact uh, really talking about how um, um, they are also um, not having a voice or say or uh, in, in, um, in the way that their lives are affected by it. So 
climate change is not a um, it's not a um, human catastrophe. It's a white Western capitalist catastrophe, and so this is kind of going back to what um, uh, you ladies were talking about uh, words. Um, but the way that we frame it is very important. And right now, climate change is, is defined as a pattern of the Anthropocene. Even that word is very loaded. And the way that it's kind of erasing race from the debate is that um, the Anthropocene is basically claiming, well, uh, we're all in this together. You know, our impact is the same. Uh, this is a human problem, right? We're all in it. We're all responsible. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's just a... a small part of the world making decision for all of us um, in this regard it's still a global human problem when in fact even just talking about the Anthropocene is is, uh, is uh, erroneous in, in that sense because um, this is not an Anthropocene it's a uh, well you know we can talk about what these words are and, and how we can translate it some some people like Jason Moore for instance are talking about the Capitalocene right pointing out that in fact it's the, the um, coming about of a particular system, the capitalist global economy that uh, brought about climate change. So it's already kind of shifting responsibilities for it towards, um, uh, towards the capitalist and the, the core, um, the, the rich nations or the global north or however you want to call it. Um, but I don't think that's enough of a, of a of an emphasis because capitalism is still, is, uh, capitalist scene is still defining a system that's about um, the organization of, of uh, global political, of, of uh, global economy, not, not really about its uh, unequal re racial roots. And so this is where I think decolonizing and decolonizing um, uh, work is essential because it's, it's enabling us to um, make these links visible and actually dive digger um, uh, dive deeper um, that, and then the, the um, capitalist structure as the root of inequality and actually look not just as it, as it, as it um, historical roots um, um, in the racist superstructure, but also how it plays out today. I mean, um, uh, it's not just that indigenous people, for instance, are disproportionately affected by climate change. They're also um, the uh, safe keepers of biodiversity. So not only are they disproportionately affected by it and have no visibility um, and, and, and almost quasi no voice in the global decision making or um, the way that the SDGs are defined and all, and all, and all of that, but they're also protecting 80% of the biodiversity. Although indigenous territories is actually only 24% of, of the world's uh, land. So there's this really interesting invisibilization that occurs with that separation between um, uh, colonization and, and climate change that really needs to be addressed today. Um, and so I was, I was wondering in that regard, and, and um, I will um, leave it to Nolita to, to uh, talk to us more about how um, how does that division of separation play out in uh, the real world and, and how do you think the, uh, the rich nations are addressing that problem or, or not? <laughs> so the perspective of what I see is that we're looking at an issue that took centuries to entrench. Um, both, as you said, from the capitalist scene and the, you know, how the structure of globalization and capital and everything that involves that, as well as the structure around the globalization of human identity. Um, it took centuries to entrench. It took, um, it took time and effort and continuous oppression to entrench these systems that we're in. And it has resulted in a myriad of problems, but also problems that include this climate crisis that we're facing, as you said, and the unequal distribution of the impacts of this climate crisis. Um, I think the it's we're trying to deconstruct. Um, you know, the word decolonization. We're trying we're trying to break down systems while we're trying to restructure. And we're trying to do it in a lifespan that's supposed to be approximately less than a generation because it is, at the end of the day, the climate emergency is the climate emergency um, in conjunction with all of the problems that we're currently facing. Uh, I think the drivers of international correspondence, um, and I'll call them that, I won't go specific to who's who, uh, 
I think that they're, they're showing an understanding that there's an urgency, um, but I think frankly, they're treating it a little bit as if it's a group assignment. Um, when, as I said previously, it took centuries of work by a pretty specific group of people to get us to this position that we're in. It took centuries of oppression of a, a larger group of people to get them entrenched and entangled into the system of, um, in, entangled into the system and this march towards modernity in inverted commas that we are in today and it's frankly um it's in a manner that's reminiscent of colonization and and you know colonial thought um we have an equalizing of the burden which is unfair um and then when i say equalizing of the burden i mean there's an equal expectation of everyone to meet these um these these climate goals uh but also we can't remove responsibility from um the global south on what they can do to help the problem because if they're the one, if we're the ones facing the brunt of the problem, I think it's also the largest incentive with us to try and figure out the fastest way possible to reach there, even though we didn't create a bulk of the problem. Um, I think my personal opinion, I think we need to take a closer look at how we measure this climate. Um, climate. Uh, my understanding is that some organizations have told governments to go back and create their own plan, um, but these plans are probably going to be evaluated on a basis that is compared to someone else. And we can't do that because an example of why we can't is that in South Africa, we have a country that's reliant on coal, but it, it is not meeting the energy demands of the country based on different incompetencies and debt and et cetera, et cetera. So we're struggling to pro provide energy for everyone. Um, and we're also struggling with debt. We can't then be placed, uh, um, placed in the same level of expectation as maybe a Germany or you know someone else. It's 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 not possible. It has to be done on a case by case basis. And um, for Padma, how you see the role of language and ideas can play in this scenario when it, um, especially in terms of international correspondence in the climate change and decolonization. Yeah. Hey, um, I latched on to a few things that both you and Ode said about who is visible and who is made invisible and who is who is heard. So I'm going to just um, read an excerpt from the story as an answer um, to that. And I think that these are the these are the stories that don't get um, heard conventionally in the conversations where decisions about what our lives are going to be like in the very near future are being made by people who are not going to suffer the same repercussions of their decisions, as you said, because we just simply aren't going to experience climate change um, in the same way across the world. And we know who is going to suffer more than others in, in this situation. So I'm reading from this book, it's Agam, Filipino Narratives on Uncertainty and Climate Change, and it was published for the Institute of Climate and Sustainable Cities. Um, and just to say quickly that the AGAM agenda is one, one thing that the Institute is doing, and we are a Philippine-founded and Philippine-based NGO that interacts at the international policy level. So trying, working very hard also to make vulnerable countries and vulnerable voices heard in those high level discussions um, on things like climate finance, climate policy and renewable energy. And, um, and some of my colleagues have been doing this work for, for decades. And after a while, the statistics and the figures um, just became almost mind numbing because everybody knows them and everybody says them over and over. And there was this strong sense that we need another way to speak of this and to make visible what's invisible. And this is a beautiful story. I won't read the whole thing because we, you both have a lot more to say and um, we don't have all night for this. So in this story, it's called Ten Fingers, and it's by Merlinda Bobis, and it's originally written in Bicol, which is a Philippine language spoken um, in southern Luzon. And the narrator is a young Filipina who's leaving to go to the U.S. to do her Ph.D., and she's bidding goodbye to her parents, who are farmers, um, in Bicol. 
and her father jokes about her being a doctor and coming back to fix him and she says not not that kind of doctor and he says i know i know but you know me i'm just a farmer um anyway so she's in the u.s studying when a storm hits her home in bicol and there's devastation and so many people have died and she's the story takes place she's in the airport waiting to board an airplane and she says I wish to pass his face around to all the passengers lining up towards the plane. Please see what can't be seen. Ten fingers strong in the mud, on the plow and the buffalo, on the rice grains, on his knees that always ache at night. Please see what is invisible. Behind that window in the photo, my mother making me a sandwich so I don't get hungry on this trip. Special corned beef, she said, from the new grocery a little farther up. But the sandwich is taking forever to hold back the only child's departure, to hold back the tears. Ten fingers of my mother, ten fingers of my father. Please see the invisible. The many times in a year of fixing the roof wrenched away by the many storms. The many times of evacuating because of the flood the many times of scavenging for rotting rice. The other day, the wind, the rain wrenched a multitude of houses from the earth. Superstorm I saw on my computer when I was finishing my conference paper. But no one saw in the library how my heart was wrenched out of my chest. So now I'm at the LA airport going home to what I don't know, to what I can't see in the news, our house, our farm, my mother, my father. I can't see them or the impending landfall in my chest. But I see you, you gasping at this tragedy on TV, on your laptops and iPhones as we wait to take off. Please, I beg you, look closer. It is my father, my mother, and all of 20 fingers holding back this storm. So that's the story, Ten Fingers, by Merlinda Bobis, uh, which she translated from Biko to English. And I think what, what stories like this do is they remind us of the human, the very human experience and pain and impact of the climate crisis, which... Um, often gets left out. I mean, we talk about the suffering and we talk about the impact, but, but we often forget the humanity. Um, and so this book and the next one that we're coming out with, um, which is an international anthology written in the same manner, when writers were invited to contribute to this, we, they, we were asked not to use um, the jargon that's commonly used to talk about climate change um, in order to steer the stories or poems or essays even towards a more human and more relatable um, conversation and exchange of stories. And um, because also because most people don't recognize themselves in the jargon right, or in the statistics, even if those statistics are about us, the rising sea levels, the salination of fresh water sources, the droughts that are making it so difficult to grow food, and the unpredictable weather, too much rain pouring in a day when it usually pours over a period of a month, over several days, rather than just one day where you get one month's worth of rain. Um, and people are, it, it's very strange to be in the field with local people and to hear scientists and politicians telling them this happened to you because of climate change. It's almost as though climate change makes it excusable that that's happening. And I think this refers back to what you were saying, Nolita and Ode, about how um, it's almost as though this is this is happening because climate change 
we've brought about climate change. All of humanity has brought about climate change. But, but as Ode pointed out, that's, that's not the case. It was not brought about by all of humanity. Um, it was brought about by a small percentage uh, of the world's industries and governments. Um, and so what I guess what I'm driving at here is that we're also these kinds of stories speak to those that are not part of the big debates or part of the policy negotiations but who have as much of a stake uh, in those decisions being made and in the actions being taken as the people who are actually there and this is a way to bring those stories these books that we are creating are ways to bring those stories to where the decisions are being made and to try and make other voices heard there through storytelling that's accessible to everyone and also as a way for people to recognize their own stories in the books and in the words and, and in the literature. Yeah, thank you for, um, thank you for sharing that excerpt. Um, I think when it comes to making, as you said, making visible what is invisible, I think part of the language that maybe um, as an engineering student that I am learning to have is how to use these numbers and these things that we're learning to make more visible the invisible, sort of treating it like a, yeah. I know this is a weird thing to say, but treating it like it's, a, it's, it's poetry, it's a language, because I think to a certain extent, a lot of us are working to do good. And a, a lot of we're working to do good, and so we need to be able to properly communicate and to, as you said, to not just say it's because of climate change, but to actually, to those of us who have it within us to be able to understand the numbers and contextualize things in terms of numbers, we need to be able to then turn around and communicate to someone that it's not only because of climate change. Mm -hmm. Your story is because the, the context of the problem you're facing has a whole story behind it. And this is how I contextualize it. I, and I think a key skill that I, I've been trying to lobby a lot of my lecturers is that we need to be able to teach our, need to be able to teach our students to speak this language, not only to say um, this activity can create or optimize or et cetera, et cetera, but to say the context of the problem was this and using empathy, we have now worked towards making the invisible a lot more visible. Uh, an example of this is that right now, um, well, after I finish the project I'm doing now in school project, is that we're going to be working on our final honors thesis. And what we chose was the topic to to show the invisible trade-offs between water, energy, and food in communities where there was pre there was previously a mine. Um, there's a lot of mining that happened in South Africa. I think the, one of the main reasons why the, the colonizers came to South Africa was the fact that it's halfway between Europe and India, but also by sea, but also because um, there was a wealth of diamonds here. So there's there's a mining industry. Mines come and they leave. And so there are, there are communities that form around this and there are stories that are created. There is an entire context behind fatherlessness and a lot of things that happened in this country just in the context of mining. So what we're trying to look at is because South Africa has South Africa's created a law where mines are now expected to create to have some efforts to address the prob the problems that they've created by you know by being there. Um, the rate at which this law is implemented is something I don't not necessarily hundred percent familiar with yet. But what we're looking at now is trying to work with different types of tools to show the story of if you make a certain intervention in terms of trying to address water, this is what happens to the energy, this is what happens to the food. If you're creating an intervention in terms of the damage you the damage you've done to the ecological environment. This is the story of what the energy is going to look like. This is the story of what everything is going to look like. Um, and so that resonated with me because I think the 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 language of how we because we I think we we're living in a world where everyone has so much information in their heads we all understand a lot of things but the people we're trying to communicate to not the people who are making the decisions but also the people who are affected by the decisions are being told two completely different stories about it when if if the solution makers understood how to communicate it we'd be in a completely different scenario um, so this makes me pose a question to 
for you or to someone who works is as you said you work with land rights is how did, how does language fit in in the work that you do yeah I think it's a great question, uh, Nolita. Thank you for that. And I think that um, taking language um, broader than, than, than just about, you know, um, um, words making and, and of course words making are important and, and also um, redefining um, ontologies. And I think this is where um, the, the stake really here is to create um, a space that's um, a different type of space where, where uh, knowledge is, is generated and created in different ways, which obviously already exists in you know, indigenous contexts and pretty much any other uh, context um, in the world and in every single community, but it's being completely co-opted by um, the pressure that we have to conform to uh, Western um, somewhat capitalist ontology. I uh, say somewhat because it depends on where you are, obviously, in which industry and whatnot. But um, but still very much um, uh, that that coercion. And so any other type of language or or knowledge is is um, systematically dismissed or accepted, but just as peripheral, right? As being just okay. Well, that's nice, you know, that's cute, but not really used to inform decision making. And this is really where um, there is a a crucial need, but also a crucial opportunity right now. I feel uh, a momentum, uh, especially in indigenous communities in the United States, but pretty much uh, in, in in every uh, community, because the the West is not um, um, is not prepared to face what's coming. And obviously, uh, in that uh, in that midst of confusion. There can also be a lot of, of opportunities and creativity. I'm thinking about U.S. native lands because um, um, here we are in on a land that's been stolen, right? But where there are territories that are um, legally sovereign and there are legally, you know, treaties of international right, international law. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities for change for creating a narrative that's different. And obviously, uh, indigenous communities know that, but also have to fight, you know, being um, uh, um, submitted to um, um, a lot of the federal laws as well. And so uh, it creates these 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 um, conflicts and these tension, but also opportunity for change, right? And we're seeing that in knowledge production, especially as it comes to you know food sovereignty. Um, and the way uh, of, talk, of talking about and, and defining and assessing climate change and impact, um, there's a lot of creativity happening right now on, on, um, on indigenous land and, and um, as I see it here happening on U.S. native land. Um, on the, gra the grassroots level, at the, um, there's a lot of uh, amazing indigenous scholarly work. Um, and a lot of practitioners very involved in, 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 in uh, creating and co-creating alternative knowledge that fits in, in both worlds somehow or that can be understood. It's kind of a translation work that's happening too, where um, I, I like to refer to it as, as trying to fit squares into circles <laughs> um, um, when it comes to interpreting and and, and, and transferring, um, you know, for instance, scientific data about climate change, how, how does that come about? How do you use it for assessment and evaluation, but also in ways that communities can understand, but also the opposite is true of where and how can indigenous knowledge be heard in, um, in uh, mainstream uh, scientific uh, environments. And I think that really this work is happening. Um, this is what we've, we've tried to do um, with the, the Native Food Sovereignty Index and the Native Land Information System, where we're really trying to, to uh, create uh, dissident um, knowledge and, and uh, use um, data set that, that are available. So within those constraints to, um, to really try to um, create usable information, but also how do we reconceptualize data um, from that decolonial perspective so that it, it actually is able to talk about climate change in these different ways and in these ways that are more um, appropriate for um, um, for a, a lot of people, including indigenous communities. So um, I, I think that's just a very important um, debate that's open for discussion and everybody has a place, a role to play in this. Um, I just would like to um, uh, just point at um, what, what I think the, the decolonial struggle is or challenges are going to be right now is to really try to strive to create these spaces 
um, to first acknowledge the harm, there's kind of these like stepwise that the decolonizing the mind process uh, takes. Um, and that's at the individual level and at the collective level. And, uh, we can use them as ways for us to reflect upon ourselves, um, to become either better allies or, or, or better um, actors within that transition, but also at the collective level. And this is how we bring out change. Um, the first step is acknowledgement. Uh, not wanting to jump into uh, reparation or, or work without acknowledging the harm and the injustice. Um, and uh, the second one is to be able to live with it and live with that discomfort and sit in it for a while and, and see what comes out because it might, it might bring about things that we're not um, thinking about. And then the final stage is really the he that healing process where we can actually um, come together and do something about it. Um, I'm, I'm gonna um, just offer uh, that, um, um, that that tool that I think is useful in, related, in relation to uh, decolonizing the mind. I just wanna talk briefly about that movie that came about called The Uprising, which is um, a very helpful resource and it comes with a uh, educational toolkit um, that people can use to, um, to take to their communities and, and do that work on ourselves, but on themselves, but also at the collective level. So um, I'm going to give it to you ladies to give uh, final <laughs> reflections. All right. Um, I guess I'll end by saying thank you to Od and to Nolita for sharing what you shared. It, it was, it gave me a lot to think about. And um, this was a good space to to listen to each other. And what I do want to say is that all the work that we're doing matters. Um, so when we talk about language and removing jargon, for example, it's not to say that the jargon doesn't matter or the science doesn't matter or policy doesn't matter. Those things matter very much and they're instrumental to the way we're reshaping the world. And I'm speaking here to what Ode said about knowledge production and being very aware of how that takes place and where and for whose benefit and how, but also to what Nolita said about actual actions taking place in an urgent context an urgency that many of us feel on a daily basis, but it's not reflected in the way actions are being taken at the higher level. And, um, but I think that alongside the science and the policy, um, art matters as well, and stories matter as well, um, not just to communicate, um, to people who are not immersed in the science or not immersed in the policy. So stories aren't just there to communicate, but they're also there to give us a source of strength, a source of ideas, to give us space to reimagine what's possible in the world. And these, these stories also speak of our humanity and our very human experience of the climate crisis, which tends to disappear in, in the numbers and in the, in the policies. And, and at bottom, it's about how we're going to live our lives and how our children are going to live their lives. It's about our people seeing themselves in the stories being told, but it's also about challenging and inviting artists and writers to channel their creativity towards making it possible for us to reimagine the world under the climate crisis and to work as allies and to do this work of decolonization as well in our own creative spheres. That's it. So this, after this panel, um, there's going to be a reading of a poem called Radical Tenderness. Um, so as my final thought, um, I'd like to add an opinion in conjunction to that. Um, for me, radical tenderness is to empathize, it's to pay attention to the space that we inhabit and the people we are working with and the people we're working to help. It is to understand the person um, as an individual, but also as a collective of efforts, potentials and abilities. The aim of action is not to plow through towards a solution by any means necessary, but it is to exercise tenderness and empathy to help a person reach the future that they see. Um, and so to those like myself, 
who are obsessed with action and need to, um, we need to learn how to contextualize our entanglement with the colonial and societal factors that exist. Um, as the poem would, um, is going to say, is that you need to feel your entanglement with everything, including the ugly, the broken, and the fucked up. So, so that when we as engineers and we as creatives, when we do what we do and we simplify wicked problems by using assumptions, we need to understand the burden of what that assumption is. We cannot carry on with this obsession with perfection um, that the Western, that the that the Western chokehold of modernity has held on to us, but we need to adapt a policy of the fact that we will do what is best for us and our holistic existence. And with that said, that is my final thought. Everybody throwing shade while my hair getting played. Culture being erased. So I speak a rap a hole without a shame. Bahanisu na habehin. Jibi nea. Nu usi. Hatini ini. Jawa ani. Chibati. Hinana eti. Heti che. Heti tani. Nu sa ha ho. Force and slay me. Even by my own race, once I hit the pavement, can't even embrace those written treaties. Are such a disgrace, put in place to betray and displace. Written in our DNA, we remember our ways when settlers came. They were too hard to tame. They took from my land and never gave back. They came to claim, but we were not the same. It was not a fair game. They changed us their name and rename. Can't take the blame. Are they even ashamed? We were their targets, so they took their chance and aimed Breaking us until we almost lost everything Raping all women to produce our springs Killing up a buffalo to near extinction They had the ammo, so they made it a mission Promise to supply us food, but now we conclude that we're just being screwed Those legal rations are toxic, but my Nawat loads of boxes And our water is poison, but they won't ever test it Fighting for clean water got my siblings arrested We've been through so much, but you just exclude They look the other way now so they don't intrude Back in the day, they stole our kids away And beat them till they pray like the nuns They took so much away that we became numb The pain we still feel, so we take another pill We are still trying to heal While they pass another bill to conceal and kill Giving us the blame for scalping Cause they were ashamed for helping We thought they were trying to us be at ease Here they were just spreading their destructive disease Strategically trying to make us disappear It's a good thing that we're still here Standing on the porch looking out Trying to find a way out Trying to find a way out